Rob told me that last week somebody preached for 50 minutes, and that was five minutes over the schedule. <laughs> so I got a, I have a timer here, so I'll start it now. Because God forbid we do that, you know. You know, but uh, it is really great to really great to be here and see all of you. We, we are living in Perth now, which is a comparable church. We, uh, it, we started the year off with 105 members. We have about 125 members now, and we have about 20. Two uh, baptisms so far. Our region, the spa region, has had about 190 baptisms so far this year. Uh, we planted a new church in Newcastle this year as well, which is a city of about a half a million, uh, which is about two hours north of Sydney. If you know your geography, you probably don't know Newcastle. Uh, but they uh, we sent a team of 20, they, and they're at 40 members now. They've had 20 baptisms as well in that in that planting with Ben and Brooke May. Uh, we're excited. We have churches in Papua New Guinea. He, he didn't mention that. That's a country north of us, uh, which is half of uh, this big island. is called Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's about 7 million people in that with about 300 languages. Or a third of the languages of the world are in this one little country. So, But uh, they speak pidgin as their language and we and understand English a bit. And if there are connections here. It's so exciting. You know, I, of course, we've known Robin. We, we've known each other forever. But we don't really have spent a lot of time together, you know, and so I'm really looking forward to being here and, maybe, and having dinner afterwards or lunch or whatever the time is. And, uh, and of course, heard of him and the great work that they've been doing here in Tucson. And before that, they were in Oregon before that. I know he goes back to Okinawa or something. Or is it? Yeah. And, and, and Okinawa, of course, is the place where, where my, I have three sons in the minute, son-in-laws in the ministry. One's David Bliley, who was who was. Began to it was restored in Okinawa. How crazy is that? You know, we're all linked together. And then Dave spoke at, at the conference that, that Rob and Pam were, uh, were doing last week. Last week, maybe. Yes. Amen. And of course, there's others. You know, there's Alexa uh, Coleman. Alexa and Coleman. Alexa, we've known forever as well, wherever she is, uh, since she was a, uh, bef maybe before she was a teenager, a, a long time. You know, and, and uh, uh, Coleman less, but I'm looking forward to get to, get to meet him. But I, I was a campus minister before we moved to Australia at LSU. And uh, right when I was leaving, one of our visitors was a guy named Sturgeon. And of course, his son now is here. Whoa. You know, and I thought, you know, because I remember leaving there and Randy and his dad, Randy, was stubborn at that point. And we were having these kind of work where you, you can quote, he knows that. Yeah, he's learned a lot since then. And now his, his dad, Randy, is an elder in the Philadelphia church, in fact. And so I read your first name again, but Connor, Connor, that, that's right. And and I, mean, I and I don't know whether the love, uh, John and Martha loves. Well, there they are, my goodness gracious. Wow. Martha was one of our first conversions at LSU, Louisiana State University. Uh, and she was, uh, uh, he was in ROTC at the time. I still remember her walking with the, Flag at an LSU Tiger football game, and uh, and then she met John, who was a, a, a geologist out of La Lafayette, and and they got married, and uh, and they were in Houston, and I, I, Amen. And I, are your kids here? Yeah, we got all the connections are amazing, and somebody converting the Gold Coast is now here. I mean, the kingdom is definitely a worldwide kingdom, and and God's blessing us in so many so many ways. <laughs> we we got we went back to Australia in 2012, and uh, the church, the whole spa region was about 750 people. Now it's about 1,600 people, and so we're excited about that doubling, uh, over doubling now. And Sydney Sydney tripled, and other places have tripled as well. Enough of that. Enough of that. Uh, I, my text today is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, and a little background in, in, in information. Again, my my wife, we've been married for. 50 years, our anniversary is December 16th, I guess next next week. But I haven't done anything yet to prepare for this event. <laughs> I'm glad I reminded myself. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so we're, we're celebrating our 51st at, at an anniversary. Uh, and hope we'll, we'll be in, in Sedona for that. Uh, so that's, that's awesome. That's a magical spot as well. Full of vortexes and all the like. And we have, again, three daughters. One, one lives in Perth with her husband, Sam. Her name is Michelle. They lead the Perth Church. And one, uh, David and Megan lead the Sydney Church. And Forrest and Annie are in Phoenix leading that church there as well. 
Amen. Great grandkids as well. And you probably know, a lot of you know them better than you know me for sure. First Corinthians, you know, if, the Corinthian situation, the Corinthian church, if you've been around the kingdom or if you read your Bible much and you said, what, what's a great church in the New Testament? You, you, you could say the Corinthian church is famous or you could say it's infamous. And more infamous than famous, isn't it? You know, they had divisions within the church. They had lawsuits. People were suing each other even before the United States. You know, <laughs> there, there were prostitutions going on. Members are still fraternizing that. There was a charismatic craziness going on. They had doctrinal inaccuracies. And yet in chapter 1, when Paul writes them, sometimes you can, you can learn something by what is not said as well as what is said. And so when Paul writes to the Philippian church, he begins by thanking God for their partnership and affection they have for himself and for one another. He builds them up. He writes to the church at, Col at Colossia for being a beacon of light to the whole region of the impact and impacting the gospel by their lives. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he says about them, I thank God that his grace was given to, 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 the, to you at Corinth. Because you can always find something good to say about somebody. And thank God for God's grace for the Corinthian church. Our text is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and following. Let's read that together. And we'll draw a few points from that within my next uh, uh, 38 minutes that I've got left. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. <clears throat> By the way, my, 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 my throat is raspy. You can give me a glass of water. It'd be very nice. I don't need a glass of water. You, you, you would do that to help me, but it won't help. I have a raspy voice. So amen. So I'm not in pain. Uh, only your ears are in pain by hearing it. But 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become, you've begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We even made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands, when we are cursed we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to the moment, right up to this moment. And I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. And even though you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you did not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, who I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon. If the Lord is willing, then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. But what do you prefer? Shall I come with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love or with a gentle spirit? That's a fairly strong text. That's a very strong text. And Paul begins it by saying, you know, uh, you know, maybe there's a slide before this slide. He says, he says, he says don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. It, it's about you. It's about you. Verse 6, he says, I applied these things about myself and Apollos for your benefit. In other words, 
I'm not just talking to talk. I'm not talking to just, you might hear some facts about my life. I'm, I'm applying these things to our life so that you might learn. So that you might learn. You know, Paul's already used the metaphor of, of, a, of a gardener. I, I planted Apollos watered. He'll use the metaphor of a builder later on in chapter 3. But here he's the servant. Literally, the steward or the manager. And the church and the ministry are not ours. We're just stewards. We're just managers. We're just following orders. And so Paul has talked about these two chapters. He reminds them, again, not, these are not just interesting thoughts or philosophical points. They're meant to be applied. Verse 6, that you might learn. And the Greek word is mat, mat, matetis. And matetis is the base word for disciple. A disciple is a student, is a learner. Of the word discipleship and discipling and, and disciple all come from this word about learning. We're meant to, we're meant to learn. Paul says, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 28, you know, go and make disciples. Uh, you know, uh, that, that, that word is in the imperative, which is qualified by two participles. After you make disciples, baptize it, then you, you're baptizing and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's teaching them to obey what they've already agreed to. At anybody's baptism, there are two questions we ask. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Yes. And what's your good confession? And they always say, Jesus And that's when everybody claps. That's when everybody claps. You know, because and so and so at your baptism, you say, Man, I, I'm all in. He is my Lord. Now you don't have a clue about the application of all that in your life. <laughs> you got no idea where that's going to be leading you. What's going to, what's going to happen? And so and so Jesus says, you got to baptize him. Amen. Jesus is Lord. And then you got to get them to teach and to obey what they have already agreed to. I always use the illustration of, of, of your, there's, in our brain, Jesus is Lord. In our heart, it's not there. So we click and drag, and that process is called discipling. Where we get to get what's in our head on our hearts. Because you all know what's in your head, not always on your heart. And our relationships with one another are meant to do just that. So Paul will talk about that, about uh, this text about being learners. Paul, Paul it's interesting because if you read the Gospels, Jesus' main message is the kingdom of God. And yet in Paul's epistles, he rarely talks or ever talks about the kingdom of God. Why is that? Well, flat out, he's making churches in the Roman Empire. And going around talking about another kingdom is not the kind of thing you want to do in the Roman Empire. They're very tolerant except about that. But he, but he teaches the same concepts of the, of the reign of God. And the same thing is true about Paul doesn't use the word disciple because, it, because he's going to Corinth and every time Dick and Harry was a disciple of some philosopher. And so if you're a follower of Zeno, you would go, you were a Stoic, but there was no Stoic church. It was just you and that philosopher and it was a kind of a, a, a teaching thing and you, you did your own life. There was no fellowship. And so Paul said, no, no, it's, it's not just Jesus is Lord, but we are his body as well. And so he doesn't use that metaphor, not because he doesn't agree with it, because the book of Acts is full of it, and it's applicable to our, to our lives. And, and so here, Paul says there are some lessons from, from these, these, metaphors, these metaphors are for you. So let's look, if we could, at, at three or four points here from this text at the time that we've got left here. i got 31 minutes. i got a lot. So first point, learn by imitation. He says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. The examples of Paul and Apollos and even Timothy are to be imitated, he says in this text. The Greek word for imitation is the Greek word mimite. We get the word mimic. We're, we are to, to copy that. Paul says, he says I'm sending you Timothy. Because if you watch Timothy, you'll know something, you'll be reminded about me. Because Timothy imitates me. A bit like, you, I could kind of tell, when I met Rob and Pam's son, I thought, yep, that's Rob and Pam's son. <laughs> he looked at him, but he also, he also stood like him. <laughs> he 
You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, he's a handsome, handsome. Lad. Praise God, he takes after his mother. And, and, uh, and you know, and, and, you know, and, and what Paul says, I'm telling you, Timothy, because he's learned to imitate that. You know, he goes on, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, of course, that, you know, imitating, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's not just imitation of a man, but imitation of Jesus that's illustrated through people's lives. You know, Timothy will remind them of Paul's way. It's all about Jesus, but there's a need to ask for us to look for examples to model after. Someone incarnating the qualities of Christ to give us the example to follow. Someone where the truths of Jesus are lived out in flesh and blood that you can see and recognize and say, I, I need to be like that because that reminds me of Jesus. You know, that, that's, uh, you know, he, he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators to be. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leaders, consider the outcome of the rare way of life and imitate their faith. That's not so popular because one probably has seen people imitate uh, others in every area, it's almost blindly. When I was a young campus minister, we all wore blue blazers, we had khaki pants, and we had yellow notepads, like Rob does right now. <laughs> And it was like, you know, we all wore sunglasses. Or we all had a gold chain. We, had, we were all, you remember that, right? John Martin, remember those kind of, those kind of days? And, it, and you know, it's, it's, it's like watching somebody who's, who's imitating Elvis. And like, if they're near Las Vegas, there are a lot of imitators of Elvis around this particular world. What Paul is talking about is not blind uh, imitation, but particular imitation in some specific area where someone's life follows Christ. Uh, and models Christ. No one is like Jesus in every area in this room. We know that. Oh, man, you're just like Jesus. Oh, we, we would all be uncomfortable if somebody told us that. And, and, we'd, and we'd feel sorry for you for even thinking that, right? You obviously don't really know us. But, 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 look, but, but, but he puts us in the body of Christ which is Christ, because all over this place, there are good models of many different aspects of Jesus and his character and his ministry. So we can learn from one another in this tapestry to do all that, to be more and more like Jesus. It's kind of like, like in so many areas, you got, you got to look around. It's like to me, like, like raising children, you know, uh, looking around for good examples. I'm amazed at so many young couples who have their first baby, and they think they're the first ones to ever have a baby. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 and that they're filled with a congregation of people who've actually lived out and, and, and illustrated how to be, yet keep our faith active and be a good parent at the same time. But they don't ask. It's all about baby-wise. You know, I'm not against baby wise or everything. That, is that a book? Well, I'm not against. I mean, I've not read it. I, I, maybe it's your favorite book, maybe next to the Bible, whatever. But I'm just saying, man, you know, yeah, I, I need to, I, I got to practice my faith and be a good mother and a good father. But let me look around. Not everybody in this room has done that, but some of you have. Let me learn from them. You know, it, it's, it's about sharing our faith. I'm amazed at the strong opinions of some about how to effectively share your faith. And yet, those same people are not effective doing just that. You know, uh, you can't be too strong. Or you can't have cold contact. Uh, you must be relational. I, I think that is the best way. Fine. But I also know that half of our conversions are cold contacts. It doesn't, let, let, let me learn. You know, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me imitate people who are actually effective at doing just that. You've got a real conviction about how it should be done, but no fruit. You, you need to stop, you know, stop, stop looking in the mirror and find somebody you, and say, hey, they're doing it. Let me learn from them. It may be about hospitality. It may be about finances, where somebody really knows how to use their money properly and give generously to the church and God blesses them in other ways, let me learn from them. 
uh, uh, so many ways that God wants us to imitate in God's church. The Corinthians, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, who, who are we imitating? I, I, I love it here. Paul contrasts here in this passage those who are wise in Christ with those who are fools for Christ. So many times we want to be wise in Christ. And when was the last time you thought, no, I don't look around for a fool for Christ? Scum of the earth, the refuse of the world, rags and homeless. Let me imitate that. No, 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 I want to get the last, the latest, you know, teacher, teacher person or whatever to increase my, my head knowledge. I'm not against that, don't get me wrong. But are we imitating being fools for Christ? Whose model are you going after? Second, second one, second slide. Do not go beyond what is written. <clears throat> First Corinthians 4, 6, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Don't go beyond what is written. Here they were going beyond what was written in the scriptures to get caught up in the cult of personalities in the Corinthian church. And they're not the last person to, people to do that. We all tend to follow people rather than to follow Christ. Taking pride, Paul writes, in one, over, one man over another. You know, leadership is God-ordained. Uh, that's, that's true. But there are restrictions to leadership and to people's attitude towards leaders. We follow Christ first and foremost, and we're tempted to go beyond what is written, either as leaders or as followers, but we hold up leaders uh, who imitate Christ, and bless, we, we hold them in honor. That's what is written. In other words, that is what is written in the Scriptures. But in so many areas, we're tempted to go beyond what is written. Let me give a clear example of that in the next slide. Uh, with, uh, you know, in Deuteronomy 17, 14, just, if you can read that, the print's kind of small, I'll read it out loud. Moses writes, when you enter the land, the Lord your God has given you and have taken possession of it and settled in on it. And, and you say, let us be a set of king over us like the nations. Be sure to appoint over you the king of uh, the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not, let a, do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. That's pretty clear. <laughs> That's pretty clear. And yet there's King Saul, and yet there's King David, and then we come to the smartest king of all, the wisest king of all. And who's that? Solomon. Solomon. And what did we learn about Solomon? Maybe the next slide there. You know, chapter one, of, chapter 11, verse 1 of, of, of Kings. King Solomon loved many foreign wives, women, besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. That's the second the scripture after that. In, it's actually quoted, he, he quotes a scripture from Deuteronomy 7, verse 3. But it says, nevertheless, and I highlighted it there because that's our word that we use so often. Yes, I've read it, but nevertheless. <laughs> I've got another plan. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Why does that sound so modern? How many times have I heard that? You don't understand, I really love it, and I'm Christian, I just really love them. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You know? It reminds me of this movie called uh, with, uh, uh, about an angel who goes to Los Angeles. I've got the movie, and I'm off, off my script. But, but, it's, but uh, he, he's an angel uh, called the City of Angels, or the Angel, whatever it is, with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Nicolas Cage as an angel. And he, falls, he goes to Los Angeles, City of Angels, and he, he's taking care of this girl, and he falls in love with this human. And he says, he, he says in one, in, at one point, you know, I'll give up eternity just to sniff her hair. And I heard that, and I said, are you kidding? <laughs> what happens when you wake up one morning and smell a breath? <laughs> it, 
It is the truth. You know, are you kidding? It's so, are you kidding? Eternity? Eternity? He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart, as the scriptures wrote. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully, was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. Again, a repetition of that verse. It's a reference for, uh, from Deuteronomy 7, 3. You know, if you read 1 Kings 10, 18 through 29, we don't have time. It talks about the vast amount of horses that Solomon had. Vast amounts of gold and silver. So that silver was like copper. It was just plentiful under his reign. And of course, the vast amount of wives and concubines. I mean, it's so clearly written, yet he trusts his own wisdom. You know, it's, it's, you know it, it wasn't just like Solomon had, a, had some kind of fetish about getting a lot of wives. He said, I, I, I just want to live at peace with all of my neighbors. And I know if I marry one of the king's daughters, princesses, from all the kingdoms that surround me, then we'll be at peace because we'll all be related. Let's all have a peaceful kingdom. It makes sense, doesn't it? Practiced in Europe over and over again with, with little success. You know, but, but yet, yet in his own wisdom, he says, I know what God said, but I'm going to trust my wisdom and, and my horses and my alliances rather than trust God to keep me safe. You know, trusting your own. It reminds me of you know, the jokes at times I tell. There are five people in a plane. There was the pilot. There was the world's smartest man, Elon Musk. The world's richest man, Bill Gates. And there was an old preacher and a hippie backpacker. And the pilot comes out and says, sorry, the plane's going down. There's five of us, but we only got four parachutes. And he grabs one and jumps out. The world's richest guy, Bill Gates, says, I, I can't die. I'm Microsoft. And I'm a head of AI and, and I, I don't know, he has some kind of video game company too. I don't, whatever it is, I don't even know. I, I, I can't die. It'll throw the markets off. He takes a parachute, jumps out. Elon Musk says, I, I can't die. I, I got 20 more inventions to change the world. It's important that I live, you know? And he, he takes a parachute and jumps out. And the old preacher turns to the young hippie backpacker and says, son, I've lived a good life. I'm ready to meet the Lord. You're young. You take the last parachute and jump. And the hippie says, that's okay. The smartest man in the world just jumped out with, with my backpack. <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's, that's the joke of it all, isn't it? That I'm going to go beyond what is written because of what my culture is saying or what others are saying or because we've gotten so smart as humans. Do you really believe that? If you do, you're... I don't want to say a word I shouldn't say like this. <laughs> we have to be careful when we go beyond what is written and let, as I said, our cultural issues and our change our doctrine. I, I live in Australia and, and we are affected by some of your things that make the news and all the issues that I've seen in the news about all, about all the things you probably are, are so thick and tired of talking about, maybe. But, but, but it's, you know, we, we, don't, we don't quite have that. But, I, but I, 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 what's written? What is written? What should, it be, what should the church be like by what is written? What does it say? You know, how to become a Christian? Well, yeah, I know we've got to repent and be baptized, but let's, 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 let's go beyond that. Let's, let's be wise about that and more open. Okay, really? About marrying a disciple. Yeah, it really, it says, don't be up with an, unbe with an unbeliever. Believer, let's broaden what that really means. And again, you know, I want to go be want beyond what is written because I think I'm wise. I think I'm smart. About what it means to sacrifice or what it means to live the committed life. I mean, if Solomon, with all of his wisdom, trips up, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? No wonder in the same verse he mentions pride. 
Who do you think you are? The last, third point. We, 15 minutes. Third point. We must learn not to get puffed up. Uh, you know, there's none, none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? Who do you, what do you have you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not? The NIV uh, says, says pride. ESV literally says uh, the word puffed up. It's a Greek onomatopoeia. It's a Greek word, fuseo. And onomatopoeia is a word that sounds like it's meaning it. Fuseo means puffed, like grumble or whine or whinge or all onomatopoeias. And, and Paul says here, this ancient metaphor, uh, he's the only New Testament writer to use this, this, meta, this, uh, this word. <coughs> he uses it here and he uses it in Colossians as, as well. The colorful word about being puffed up, an old metaphor. He is full of himself. He gets a swell head. Uh, he gets the big head, right? But what puffs us up? Let's consider several things that Paul mentions here. One is knowledge. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. We, you know, love, uh, knowledge builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So we know knowledge, and Paul uses the same Greek word there. There's nothing wrong with knowledge or education. But there's something we've seen in people, smart people, who know a lot, and they're tempted with pride so that their health, their heads swell up. And sometimes we excuse it if they really do know a lot. But we never like it. No. That is the danger that all of us face to know the truth and yet to battle against the type of puffing up our arrogance. How to become a Christian. The church that God wants us to, 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 wants us to build. The scriptures are clear. Let's build that church by... Well, you think you're the only, you're the only ones? No, no. We, we're trying not to go beyond what is written in humility, and we, we want to have truth and humility at the same time. What pops us up sometimes is experiential knowledge. I, I've had this experience, and I know the Bible says uh, that you got to repent and be baptized. But but I've already met the Lord. I've had this great experience. You kind of go. You're, so it's again not what's written, but what I have experienced. It trumps it at the same time. Sometimes we let our insecurities puff, up, puff, puff us up. Next slide, you know. Uh, you know, that there's a fish called a puffer fish. And, and, and when it's under distress or attack, next slide, it puffs itself up. You know, and of course, it's, you know, it's prickly, you know. And, and, and uh, it's a defensive mechanism in its insecurity. But guess what we do? Next slide. <laughs> you know what we're talking about, right? We, we puff ourselves up. We're not that different. As I said, we don't use our bodies. We swell our chest. And you see Paul trying to deflate them in verse 7. He says, who makes you different or superior? He doesn't answer the question, but you hear it. Well, nothing, really. You know, uh, what, what do you have that you do not receive? Well, well, no, nothing. But why do you boast as though you did? I don't know. <laughs> what, is it, what is boasting? We, uh, you, you apparently don't really know who I really am. Let me tell you. Let me tell you some stuff about who I really am. So you will think more highly of who I am. And all, all the introductions that you're giving, you kind of go, oh, I don't, I don't want to hear, you know. Yeah, I, you get, you get scared of those kind of things, you know. And and and, and we're we're so we we have to tell people so, so they'll think more highly of us. We're like blowing blow up dolls, blowing blowing ourselves up in our insecurities and fears. We're haunted by our past, trying to be more than we are to prove ourselves. We are trying to justify our lives that people will see our worth and 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 like and respect us. And we're filled with our own hot air and fearful to just trust God and let his Holy Spirit fill us and make us into the men and women that God wants us to be. The, the last thing that pops us up, and I think is the most deadly, is what he says in the next slide there. You know, already you have all you want. Already 
you have become rich. What is the, what is the temptation? Already. I'm there. I'm, I'm there. Let me give you some input. There's no need. <laughs> I got it down. I, I, I've got it all down. You know, uh, when things don't work, work out, and inevitably they don't, we, we, they, we get deflated. It's de they already, you know, you don't, you, don't, you don't need any input, as I've said. You've got it figured out. No one can disciple me. But you end up walking around like an inflated balloon in a room full of people with a needle. And so a person walks up and says, I'd like to talk to you about something. You kind of go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And you already got it in, in your mind. What about you? <laughs> you know, you kind of go, oh, my gosh. This is deadly stuff. This is deadly stuff. You get that wild, scared look, that arrogant indifference like a deer in the headlights when somebody wants to talk to you. What's the solution? Well, faith and love, Paul, 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 Paul says, knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. We don't have to boast about all we've done. It's all about God. It is not proud. King James, King James translates it, it, it is not puffed, it's not puffed up. Literal again, the use of that word. We, we handle it by putting others first. We stop caring about ourselves. And because of Jesus, we love others. We come to church to give, not to get. I talked to a couple of students last night and they were saying you know people feel like people said i'm not going to invite anybody more to church because I, I think the church has got problems i'm not getting my my needs met it was like where in the scriptures that says you go to church to get something i read my bible in first <laughs> hebrews 10 you know don't give up meaning together but encourage one another all the more you see the they're approaching it's not it's like about getting something you don't fulfill that by just showing up here you fulfill it by coming here to encourage somebody else. And when every one of us is doing just that, it's a pretty awesome fellowship. But God forbid, here I am, meet my needs. Oh my, what? There's nothing about Christ. Nothing about Christ about that. It's resolved to, 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 it's resolved to just to live for others and not ourselves. Last and final point. I'm doing great. I got seven minutes. I guess I'm boasting again. I'm going to be deflated. <laughs> I'll probably go a, bit, a little bit over. Somebody's already timing this. They're going to point it out to me afterwards. We had to choose to have, have spiritual fathers and mothers. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4.14, I'm writing this not to shame you, <clears throat> but to warn you as my dear children, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. You know, so slide, slide, there's a couple of slides about, you know, teachers and fathers in the next slide. Father, there's a teacher, and then there's a father, you know. You know, 10,000, Paul uses the word 10,000. In the Greek language, uh, you can't express a number larger than 10,000. So it's a metaphor like we use the word trillion or zillion or whatever we use, or Google, Google something. You know, and, and so Paul, when he says 10,000, when Jesus says, I could have called 10,000 angels, he means more than, not just 10,000. When the, the rich, when the, the king was owed 10,000 talents by somebody that he forgives that debt, it's, it's not 10,000 talents, it's, it's a zillion, you know what I mean? It's beyond our comprehension. So he says, you've had, you've had, you've had 10,000 teachers, but very few fathers. You know, from the first grade to, through graduate school, for me, I've had 129 teachers. Well, how many of those do you think are still involved in my life? You may be thinking, well, I guess not, Mike. They're all dead, aren't they? <laughs> but I'm not talking about just now. <laughs> I'm talking about yeah, after I left. I had teachers who cared about me, but I took the exam and I, and I moved on and they, they got their next class. And You know what I mean? I, maybe you've had somebody like a teacher who's done that and Good for you, you know, but that's rare. And for me, it never happened. That may reflect my academic prowess or the lack of it. 
But, there, but there's a father figure that's different than the teacher. Both fathers and teachers teach. But there's a difference. What's the difference? Well, teachers teach and they hope you get it, get a final exam, and then there's the next class. But fathers keep on teaching even when you don't get it. I had three daughters. I said, okay, here's the verse. Keep yourself sexually pure. I hope, I hope you get it. We'll, we'll talk later. No. <laughs> I, I had, I had a, a thousand conversations. You know, or not, not specifically, but, but in general about purity and life and holiness and godliness and the kind of relationships that you really want. You know, you know and many conversations. You know, I, uh, Jesus is Lord. Let, click and drag it down to your heart about the commandments that God wants us to really have. But I was a father, not a teacher. And I wasn't going to keep talking about it until they got it, until they understood it, until they, until they, until they, they grasped it. That's a, sometimes that, that battle has been going for 40 years, guys, 50 years. You know, parenting, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still parenting, though I, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's part of our lives, you know. We're helping each other to be fa as fathers and mothers to click and drag the tremendous scriptures about what it means to be a disciple. So that you start living it out and enjoying your faith and the victories that God wants you to have in all the areas of your life. You know, helping each other to grow into the likeness of Christ without, it requires many conversations. Not like, like a father, not like a teacher. What it means to be committed. What it means to keep mission focused. Uh, what have I learned over the years? People, people get off point. And what have I tried to do more with my own life? Never get off point. Yeah, there are problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Paul repeated it. Jesus came to save the lost. And I'm not going to get off that point. I'm not going to stop here and navel gaze. I, 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 we're we're going to grow. And as we, as we go, we're going to learn more and more about Christ. But we're not going to get off point in the Tucson church about what God really wants in our lives and our mission and our character. So let's be disciples and learners in Tucson. And let us imitate and look, and look around. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit and not just hot air. Let us have fathers and mothers in our relationships here in the Tucson church. Amen.